Thank you, Steffi. How are you doing, guys? Is it as hot down there as it is up here? I took my jacket off, sorry for that, but um, my spokesperson said, yes, you're allowed to do that. This is DLD, you can go more casual, so sorry for that, but it's really up here. Great to be here. I think it's a fantastic audience, a fantastic platform, and I must say, I'm not here for the first time, but every time again, I'm impressed how much creativity, how much energy, and how much interesting people are here. So, Steffi, you gather a crowd here that's amazing, and I think that's really unique with the DLD, don't you think? Oh. Great. What, 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 what the plan is for this afternoon, or for, for my session is, I will just give you a very quick glimpse on where I see the challenges on the automotive side, and um, how the company BMW is changing, just to sort of kick off a little bit. And then um, it's always good as a woman to have strong guys with you, so I have two fantastic partners joining me a little later, and then we will kick off a little session here. So let me just uh, start with um, the challenges that we really see in the automotive. And to give you an idea of how big I think these challenges are, I would say the changes we're going to see in the next 10 years in this industry is going to be far more than what we have seen the last 30 in years in the same industry. So quite dramatic changes. And the world today, as you know, is, um, you know, we high technology, we have a lot of uh, hopefully good looking cars, sporty cars, the brand BMW is well established. And I think we all know our home turf quite well and have been very successful as, as the number one in the market, in the premium market for quite some time. But there are things that we refer to as being the iconic change. And so far, the iconic change was mainly concerning the electrification of cars. So combustion engines, all time, now electrification, putting them into the car. Honestly, that's not enough. Iconic change is about much more and not just about the electrification. So when we look into how the industry is changing now, I would really say we come from an automobile industry, that's what we are named, but we change over into what I would call an automobility industry. And obviously there are some driving forces behind there. And yes, one of course is again technology, but there are other areas in this new world. And you see from this little collage here, a lot of things that are happening and which we're gonna talk about a little more in our joint session now. I want just to pick up four of the key drivers, four of the key elements. And one certainly is the fact of autonomous driving. And there's a lot of buzz around in the media right now, and you see lots of cars going. You probably have seen this little Google car driving on its own and sometimes crashing into something else. You didn't get that joke, did you? Sorry. So, these little Google cars, but you see autonomous driving, and it's not something that is like in 10 years' time happening. It's something that's actually already here and now. So if you drive, for example, in the new BMW 7 Series, you can actually already physically take your hands off the steering wheel. You can do what you're doing right now, writing SMSs or emails or whatever, and let your car drive. So when I go in the morning, I live in Bogenhausen here in the city, and I go onto the ESA ring, which is around the city here, I can drive onto it, set the car into the right mode, and take my hands off the steering wheel, and my colleagues are pretty annoyed that I can write to them already while I'm still traveling. I've been at the CES conference earlier this year, and I go there every year, and I must say I was blown away how fast the input and how fast the progress was in terms of artificial intelligence and deep machine learning. This is not something far away in 10 years' time. This is something that's already here and now. So when we talk about autonomous driving, there are different phases of doing so. You have already the phase now where you can take your hands off. Ideally, later on, you can take your eyes off. And in the ultimate stage, you can take your brain off and really let the car drive autonomously. With that opportunity, obviously, there come a lot of new business models. You know, all the Ubers, the car sharing, the ride sharing, um, the time that you can spend while your car is driving on its own. Obviously, a lot of people want to capitalize on that time and make you spend money or do certain things. So quite a few disruptive business models will evolve out of this change in the industry. Then, of course, the whole scope of e-mobility. If you think electrification is a nice trend and it's going to go away again, forget it. It might happen in different stages. It might happen from country to country in different intensity. There's countries around where electromobility is really at the infancy. And there's countries like, for example, Norway, where electromobility is the main driving force already. 
And then you have things like what we call future, inter future interaction and seamless connectivity. So the whole topic of how you integrate your car into your ecosystem. And just to trying to explain that a little bit, in the past you had this, here's the customer, here's the car, how do those two communicate together? Today, this is the customer, and the customer has around a lot of things that are happening in his life. Like all of you, you have lots of mobile devices, lots of things integrated in your life, and the car is just one of them. So we need to find a place in your ecosystem for our mobility and play that as seamless as possible. So this is easy examples, like for example, you're listening to some music at home in your living room, you leave home, you want to go into your car, and the music continues exactly at the same spot where you heard the last tones when you were still in your kitchen and getting ready to go. But of course, there's much more with that in terms of navigation, in terms of other technologies you could put into your car and liaise with your daily life. And that's all what we mean about future interaction and seamless connectivity. The last one I would just want to share, show, and um, then we stop this little kickoff, is really, um, I don't know whether you're aware, but this year is actually the 100th birthday of BMW. So happy birthday, BMW. And uh, yeah, you can applaud, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I think, I mean, if you look at the DAX in, in, in Germany, um, there's not too many companies around anymore who have a history of 100 years and beyond. It's quite interesting. And a lot of the big new shots that are worth billions of dollars um, are less than 10 years old. So quite a change there. Anyway, for that, um, we have done our birthday party here in Munich earlier this year, and we presented the BMW Vision car, the Vision 100. And this is really what we think is where mobility is going to go to, into more autonomous driving, into electromobility, into a complete different interaction of car and people. So Steffi, I think um, we both would be a perfect fit for that car, and we both are intelligent enough to drive that. And uh, let's see what the future brings for us. Huh? I'm the tradition. No, 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 come on. She's I mean, the young one, I'm the a little bit older one. Steffi, no way, they're not going to believe that anyway, so <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> so, right. Please, I didn't want to interrupt you, are you? I, take okay. the two guys with me. So, come, let's, let's come on stage, Tom. Tom Goodwin and Alejandro Algar. Hello, everybody. We have got an awful lot to talk about. So rather than talk about everything in depth or everything very quickly, me? we're just going to try and skim the surface of some of the themes that, that you were talking about there, Sounds Hildegard. Um, I've got a tiny little story to kick off. And that's, I grew up in a, a small English village in the countryside where all the houses had thatched roofs. And I had all these books about the future and maglev trains and cities of the future. And I spent my entire life being quite disappointed that we haven't got there yet. And the other day in London, I saw the I-8 drive past, and everyone was completely mesmerized. And it suddenly made me realize that this vision of the future that for so long has been in books is now around us. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for being part of a, a team of people that are doing that. Um, and the other thing is, these are two pioneers. There are, there are many companies going out there doing a lot of talk about the future, but you both individually are doing incredible things. So whether it's with the i-Series, or whether it's you, Alexandra, with uh, the Formula E racing series. Um, so we are very lucky. I feel very privileged to be sat here with you two today. Um, but to start with Hildegard, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, no pun intended, the journey of i-Series. Because the more I've read about this, the more I realize that what you've done is remarkable. So I just wondered if you could give us a bit of a background of how the program came about, uh, what it's been doing, and perhaps a little bit more about the future of the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we started BMW i really back in the year 2007, I even believe. And the idea was really to set off a separate team. So we called it Project I at that time, because at that time we didn't have a clue on how this whole thing is going to evolve. We called it Project I, and we had a bunch of creative people who we, on purpose, closed away from the normal organization, normal procedures, the normal processes at BMW. And we gave them the freedom, basically, to say, come up with something as crazy as you can think of, but be sure that you can actually implement it later on as well. So this is where the story started. And then back in 2011, we launched the BMW i brand. And I think, I mean, we all launch brands. That's not so exciting. But we launched that brand without even having a product. So for two years, we were just launching the brand and the idea of electromobility, the idea of pioneering immobility without even having a product. And it's amazing thing for me was that after two years, what we so-called the, the aided brand awareness was already at a remarkable level 
without everybody had ever seen any car with that. And then in 2013, we actually launched the i3 and the i8, and this is where the journey started. And um, as you can see with this um, picture in the background there as well, with the um, concept of, a, of an um, i8 uh, Roadster, I think you can see how much more that is going to come and how much more ideas we have. So the idea really is to start off something crazy, closed away, off-site, not in the normal processes. Otherwise, you will never get that big stretch in order to come up with great ideas. And I heard Joe Kaiser, I think, said before as well with his innovation team that he's going to set apart um, within his company. I think if you are such a big company like, like ours, you need to have these separate spaces to really let creativity come up and, and put the foundation. You make it sound in. like it's been very easy. Ah, I wouldn't say that, <laughs> but um, probably something not to talk about here. Uh, no, but so I, I think that's, that's always the challenge. I mean, you have to create this room of creativity in such a big company, but then you have to safeguard or ring fence it in order to, to really let the people do what they're supposed to do, be creative and be visionary with what they're doing. Yeah. It sounds amazing. So, Alexandra, you were going to play a, a short video of uh, the Formula E series, but I think it's best if you describe what the series is all about, uh, how the program has taken off, perhaps a little bit about your future plans for it as well. Yes. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks so much, uh, DLD for, um, and Hildegard, for inviting me to this uh, great event. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, Where did you put your sunglasses? He had, he had really cool <laughs> sunglasses on, um, blue velvet sunglasses. Girls, I tell you, amazing stuff. Yeah, just, and they were by Elapo Elkan, right? Yeah, they were. I just took them off. Um, oh. I you think my eyes are them. starting to be white again after he last had a night, long night you know. <laughs> in Munich. But um, yeah, I mean, my name is Alejandro Agag, and I'm, I'm the founder of uh, Formula E. And uh, for those of you who maybe don't know Formula E, um, Formula E is a new racing championship. We race all around the world with electric cars. And um, when we started, and I was, it was very interesting what you said about launching a brand without a product. When we launched Formula E, we not only didn't have a product, we didn't have any cars, because they didn't exist. The electric racing cars did not exist anywhere in the world. We didn't have any cities. We only raced inside the cities, and we didn't have any cities to race. We didn't have any sponsors. We didn't have any drivers, and we actually didn't have that much money either. <laughs> Sounds like a good base, yeah. Huh? So yeah, it was Why a, on earth did you do it? It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it was really a very, very much a startup you know, in, its, in its essence. I mean, really, we, we just kind of like really believed in this, in this idea, and, um, and we believe it was going right to the place where, where things are going. You know, we believe that we are in a race between a race between technology and destruction of our planet. And one of the two will get there first. And we believe technology is going to get there first. But we believe that technology to be, to be used massively needs also to be sexy and attractive, and people need to like it. And electric cars, unfortunately, and some people are doing great things, like Hildegard and the um, i8, which is the car I drive. I'm really happy about that. Thank you for making that car. I didn't that car. To say that, I promise. But you know, people like, uh, like that are, are making electric cars sexy and, and people want to drive them. And that's what we want to achieve with Formula E. We want to create a championship. We want to bring these cars, those cars, to the streets of the cities around the world. And then people will be more inclined to buy these electric cars. So that's, that's really, yeah. I don't know that if that was your question, but yeah, it just came out. I feel, um, I feel a lot of the time that racing is used almost like an R&D facility for auto companies to test new technology. So I just wondered what kind of things that you were learning about e-mobility um, and what kind of barriers you see to the success of electronic cars as a result that comes from that. Well, obviously, technology is the key. And electric cars are great today, so I don't want to kind of uh, say that electric cars are not ready. They are ready today, and they're a great solution for the city. But there's still a lot of room for improvement. And I think we're going to get to a tipping point where everyone is going to change to electric cars. But that tipping point is going to happen at some point in the future. What what's, we want is to accelerate us? that. OK. What's stopping us from reaching that tipping point? So I think it's technology, obviously. So batteries that last basically longer and okay. are cheaper and smaller. Yeah. It's infrastructure, so you can charge your car everywhere, or you can charge it faster, or you can charge it without plugging it, or you know. So basically, the charging infrastructure, and then is the lifestyle aspect of it, the kind of like uh, appeal of electric cars as a as a sexy alternative, as a as a cool alternative. Mm -hmm. I mean, the kids that are today ten, when they buy their first car, that car needs to be electric. 
Yeah. I think actually, I mean, the, the electrification will be the new normal. I would call it the new normal. It will happen. Yes, you're right. I mean, it's a question of time. Um, but I remember one of the first meetings we had as well, as you say, very visionary. He just had a few PowerPoints to come up with the idea of Formula E. And we were like, what do you mean by Formula E? Like <laughs> Formula One, boxing girls and grid girls and stuff like that? Or what are we talking about? Yeah? And I think it's amazing, and uh, thanks, Alejandro, I think it's amazing to put up an established topic like motorsports into this world of e-mobility and make it as sexy and attractive as it is. And it's a different format then, because then we're talking about a, an urban festival, a community festival, rather than the Formula One racing classical racetrack stuff. Yeah? So it's a different character. Yeah, it's, and it sounds like it's quite a different kind of theme behind the racing. Like it's much more yeah. urban. The notion of kind of pit girls and stuff is quite different. I think that racing in the center of the city is, is, is the key of Formula E. We want to give this message that electric cars are the solution now for the cities. But Hildegard is right. We were going around the world two years and a half ago with a PowerPoint, because we didn't have anything else. And, and most of the, I mean, there was a wide consensus that Formula E was not going to make it, especially in the motorsport world. We come from Formula One, and people in Formula One were like going like, yeah, I mean, you will never, ever. I mean, I remember a very important person in Formula One, well, the most important person in Formula One. You mean Bernie? <laughs> <laughs> told me you will never make your first race. Wow. So actually, later you told me I'm glad I was wrong and you were right. But you know, it was a wide consensus we would never make it. And actually, BMW, and it's not because you're here, but it's the truth, <laughs> believed on the PowerPoint, mm -hmm. at the PowerPoint stage. Now it's easier to believe, because yeah. you know, we are going all over the world, and you can go to a race and see it. But before, we only had a PowerPoint to show. And some companies were, had the pioneering vision to say, let's, let's get into this project because it may fail or it may not fail, but at least it's worth trying. Yeah. And, and, you know, and from day one, we had the BMW um, i8 as our safety car. We had a huge crash, actually, on the first race yeah. in, uh, in uh, Beijing, um, but nothing happened, so, so it was good. Um, Hildegard, you talked before about kind of urban mobility and this idea of the technology taking off perhaps in cities first. Um, I spend most of my time in, in America, which is, normally feels quite behind the curve when it comes to this stuff. So are there actual examples of this happening already? Are there any particular cities where you've been trying programs already? Yeah, I mean, if, if you talk about the US, obviously, if you look at California, California is really setting the space, the space there for, for quite some changing immobility. But if you look in Europe, let, let me give you one example, probably a city that you, you wouldn't think of. But Copenhagen actually has the largest e-mobility fleet in the world. So we have 400 i3s in the Drive Now program in Copenhagen. Hagen. Or if you take um, Norway as a country, I mentioned that before, Norway has really, I mean, the whole, um, the whole country has set up infrastructure, tax benefits, incentives, free parking, so the whole ecosystem around e-mobility. And guess what? In Norway, we are selling more e-cars, so i3s and i8s, than any other car in the range, which is amazing. And you can say, yeah, it's a small country in Norway, yeah. But I think it, ha it shows very much how it can work. So right infrastructure, as you say, some support, incentive, getting the business going. But then it's an amazing idea, and people really are fond of it. And um, I think it's impressive to see this is not just five years ago. This is two years ago, having started. And here we are today. So the speed is enormous of that change. It feels to me like there are lots of different technologies that are coming together. So there's the degree to which there are self-driving cars, there's different forms of propulsions. Mm -hmm. There's even this idea of kind of mobility rather than car ownership. Um, so when you kind of look towards the near-term future, you know, how do you feel about companies like Uber or even companies like Apple coming into this space? Do you think, do you think we'll have a kind of hybrid structure where we perhaps buy access to a car in the same way that we have mobile phone credits? Do you think that we'll own a car and let it be used for other people? Like, what are your thoughts about how things mm -hmm. will develop? I mean, obviously, yeah, the, the, uh, the use of cars will change. I mean, I remember when I turned 18, the greatest thing on earth was that I got my driving license and get into my first car. And um, probably a lot of you went the same way. But if you look at the young generation today, the coolest thing on earth is to have the mobile devices. And that is much more important probably than having a driving license right away. And if you look at the city situations, I mean, Munich is still OK. But if you go into, let's say, Tokyo or um, Beijing or something, you know, what to do as a young person with a car because you don't get around in traffic anyway and uh, you don't have a parking space. So I can understand that these things are changing. But on the other hand, then it's our obligation to find new ways of getting still the young crowd into the cars. And I think Drive Now, our car sharing and, and ride sharing system, is, a, is an excellent example. And um, Park Now, Charge Now, I mean, Park Now is the largest parking infrastructure organized in a way. Charge Now is the largest charging infrastructure worldwide. 
So there are ways how you can develop around it, but you have to, to face those challenges and take them and, and build on them new, new ideas and new properties and um, don't whinge around and say, oh, now the world is changing and uh, we are losing our <laughs> shares. Yeah. And I think we started very early. I mean, Drive Now is already up running several years and it's not a pilot or something anymore for us. It's, it's a veritable business and, and long established already. Yeah. It seems to me that the role of software is becoming quite important in that. So typically yeah. when people used to buy vehicles, things like the in-car entertainment was perhaps one of the least important things, mm. and now it's become much more important. And even the notion of the kind of app environment for the car, you know, the navigation system, like how are you kind of embracing the kind of change in thinking that needs to happen, moving from a maker of incredible, you know, mechanical engineering to more of a kind of the experience of mm. driving in a more holistic sense? That's, that's a really good question. I mean, that's really what, what I said before, where the industry needs to change completely. I mean, we really have to shift competencies in a big scale. We're not talking about setting up one no new team or one little infrastructure team or one little uh, electronic coding team or something. It's really a massive change of competencies within our company from the classical engineering side over to software, coding, programming, and all of that. And um, I'm actually I'm, I'm quite proud to see how fast we did do this change. Yeah? I probably wouldn't have expected that from an automotive uh, company. But um, we, we started already quite a few years, like, like I said, with the Project I, it started. But now the changes in establishing these new competences have, have gone big scale and really making good progress now. I think it's and it's exciting. I mean, it's, it's cool to see how you can change such a big company in a certain way and how you can adopt quickly to these, to these challenges now. Has it meant that everything has to change? Because I imagine it goes to the very culture. Like, if, if, if you're in the, the kind of manufacturing business, you have to produce something that is finished and it's perfect, yeah. whereas the world of software is very much about rapid prototyping, testing and learning, you know, minimum viable products. So there must be quite a big tension within the organization to, you know, approach this much more kind of fast-changing world where you know, cars can even be kind of upgraded through a software patch. I mean, it's a kind of so, extraordinarily yeah. different way of thinking. Yeah, so. we do that as BMW as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, um, it's not neither or. I think it's just adding something to it. So you're not going to lose all the um, intelligence and engineering um, um, history that we have, but you have to add something new into it on the software and coding side. But honestly, I think that's the exciting mixture that we see now, how you can build out of this competency that we have, adding something new into it and really coming up with a complete different business model, complete different ideas. And if you look at things like the vision car, you can see where the journey can take us. And I think that's, that's great. Are you finding cool. similar things in your world, Alexandro? Because if you're moving from you know, Formula One racing, which was quite, in a, in a way, it was quite a classical pursuit, uh, and there was a kind of a legacy and a history to it. And now it seems to me that there are things that you're doing in the near-term future, which I don't know if I'm allowed to know about, um, that, fine. that oh, require <laughs> a very different sense of engineering and a very different way of thinking. So if, if you can talk about that, feel free to talk about that. Well, yeah, I mean, for Formula E, obviously, the, a very easy comparison is Formula One. And that's a comparison we always try to avoid. Because, what well, basically, Formula One is fantastic, and we are big fans of Formula One. Um, but it's also unbeatable. And everybody who has tried to compete with Formula One has failed. We think the big chance for Formula E is to be in a completely different space. And I think Hildegard was describing very well. Being in cities, having a different technology, doing the whole show in a different way with a different philosophy, and also anticipating where the industry is going. And, and we think, obviously, the industry is going electric, the industry is going connected, and the industry is going driverless. So we want to be on those three spaces. We are now preparing, and of course, it's a huge challenge. And again, we jumped into it really not knowing exactly how it's going to work. But we're going to do a robo race. Before the Formula A race, we're going to have a, a driverless race, uh, where all the cars are going to be identical. The only difference is the algorithm that basically drives the car around. So it's actually a competition of software engineers. Um, but we don't really know how that's going to work, because the driverless car already can beat the human. It's like the famous chess game with the computer and the human, and finally the computer beat the human, and now the computers easily beat a human playing chess. A driverless car can go faster in any racetrack than a human with the right software. What we don't know is what two cars without a driver are going to do with each other. That's the challenge. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why someone laughed, but anyway, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, anything can happen. So, but you know, if two go into a corner, who breaks and who pushes? A human can make those kind of decisions. A very kind of like crazy driver will push, a more cautious driver will stop, but the algorithms 
you know, then we go really into the artificial intelligence limitless, you know, possibilities. So it's pretty cool. We have absolutely no idea how we're going to do it. <laughs> but it. the traction that this kind of new race has gotten with companies that are in that space has been really, really amazing. Who's so, going to be on the podium? Is it just going to be like a, like a printout of the code? Or is it going to be like a series, <laughs> like a whole team know. of coders? Or? I think probably by then there will be no podiums. Yeah. There will be like something else. We have to come, <laughs> we have to come up with something. I mean, we, obviously, we, don't, we cannot give champagne to the robot. So, <laughs> and Alejandro is also going always to the CES. And we had, uh, I think, three years ago or two years ago, we had um, a racetrack just outside of Vegas. And we had M4s driving completely autonomous without anybody sitting in there in the wildest driving shift or drift that you can yeah. imagine onto that racetrack. So this is um, where you can plan the ideas and say, how can you drive an M4 with all the sound and everything in there, completely driverless, just programmed and going into a drift around the racetrack. So Incredible. I'm sure you would have liked that. Yeah. I think I, I would have been quite scared. No, it was fun. <laughs> I've, I've heard stories of people in Google cars, and for the first two minutes, no, they're I, talk, I talked about M4 GTS. <laughs> yeah. so I've heard stories about people in M4 cars, and for the first two minutes, uh, they're incredibly scared, and about two minutes later, they're relaxed, and it feels magical, and then two minutes later, mm. it feels normal. So mm. it's amazing how yeah. quickly we kind of adapt to you new technology to and our, our expectations. Yeah. So when we look, um, like this stuff always looks like it's very far in the future. Like it always seems like it's part of this world where you know, there's the Internet of Things and 5G and everything's talking to everything. But what kind of developments are you actually looking at now and what kind of programs are you looking into at the moment that you can talk about that are kind of within our reach and within a certain degree of, of, kind, of, uh, uh, of kind of probability almost? Mm. I mean, as I said, Project uh, I was the sort of founding skills that we had in order to come up with what we have today. And if I can use that expression again, I would say we are right in the middle of Project I 2.0, as you would call it, and uh, really come up with what is then the next generation. And obviously, then it will not just be electromobility and the electrification, but it will be the whole topic about autonomous driving, connectivity, and that all together. And I don't know, I mean, we have a few pictures, I think, um, because whilst we are sitting here, um, there's a big uh, birthday party going on for this 100-year celebration in London, actually. And the idea we had this year was um, that the other brands in the company, so Mini and Rolls-Royce, would actually bring a birthday gift to the BMW brand celebrating the 100 years. And while we are here, they're just now revealing this sort of vision card that you see here for BMW for the brand Mini and for the brand Rolls-Royce. So if you're interested, this is the vision car on Mini. And uh, so you can cool. see it's, it's really a different world. Yeah? And it's all electric, it's driverless, it's uh, autonomous, it's seamless connectivity, and all these ideas. And I'm sure you're going to be even more amazed when you see the Rolls-Royce one, because obviously Rolls-Royce is the one standing for luxury, being driven, chauffeur-driven. And this is uh, the huge Rolls-Royce vision car, also completely driverless, completely autonomous, going in this absolute state of luxury around the world. And yeah, if you say what is the future, I think those three cars looking together are three strong brands um, showing where the future can be with all what the I, technology. What I find amazing about this is I remember when I first saw the i8 as a concept car, and you always see pictures of concept cars and they look incredible, and then what actually rolls off the production mm. line is somewhat disappointing in yeah. comparison, whereas the, the kind of vision behind the i8 and the actual reality of it seem to be remarkable. And when you look at it in real life, it looks like a kind of illustration almost. It actually still happens sometimes when we drive around with a car that people ask, OK, and when is this coming? Yeah. When can we buy it? And I it's like, that. oh, it's here. You can buy it already. <laughs> I but said it still feels. In the i3, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but this must sort of ask a few questions about almost like the role of driving. I mean, when BMW stands for the ultimate driving machine in a world of self-driving cars, that brings about attention. Again, you know, part of the kind of the delight of a Rolls Royce is the kind of the service and the white glove that, that comes with that. So how do you sort of begin to sort of reconcile these tensions between the enjoyment of driving and the enjoyment of kind of humanity and service? Mm -hmm. I think that, that will be what I called before the new business models. You will see other things evolving around the just pure driving of it, and that will complement to that driving experience. And for the brand BMW, I can clearly say, I mean, there will always be, I mean, the center of our brand is the, the joy to drive and the ultimate driving machine and driving pleasure, et cetera. And that has to be maintained, and I think there's no reason to go away from that. There will always be the ultimate driving pleasure, but the pleasure could also be that in times where it's not so much fun to drive because you're stuck in the traffic or something, yep. you can just delegate to your car and say, please take over, and um, in the meantime, I can do things better with um, my time. It sounds like it takes a very different type of thinking in a way. 
yeah. you know, like assumptions about what cars are and what ownership yeah. means and uh, the kind of design parameters are suddenly changing. So, so I, I guess there's a final question to you all, um, and you have to be quite specific here, but what particular part of the future of mobility are you personally most excited by? <laughs> that one you didn't tell me you were going to ask. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm very excited. You know, the exciting thing is we've been talking about the future of mobility here. We didn't say one word about sustainability and environment because the good thing is now we give it for granted. Like all these cars, nobody thinks they're not electric. They're obviously electric. So the future is clearly electric. So for me, that's really the exciting part is that the future is going to be electric, therefore cleaner, therefore sustainable. Sounds good. Yeah, I would add on to that. I think the whole idea spin off more as a technologically and driven by sustainability thoughts idea. But if you look around now, what you see in terms of cars and concepts, things like your Formula E, it shows how sexy e-mobility can be. And you don't have to neglect something or give away something. You can still have your full automobile excitement there, but you can do it in a different way. And I think, as I said, it's really exciting times ahead in automotive. I think that's a very good note to end on how exciting the world is right now. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks to you guys. Thanks, Thanks to you. Thanks Thank for you. listening. All right.